Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. May the Lord bless you. We welcome every one of you. We welcome our visitors. Always glad to have visitors with us here at Northside. And you out in the radio listening audience, we appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour. That's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Church here in Athens, Georgia. And this is Father's Day. We want to greet all of our fathers in the auditorium and out in the radio listening audience. May God bless you. We appreciate the great fathers in the land today. And I hope if you're listening out there in the radio listening audience, you'll stay tuned for the singing and the message today. We'll try to be a blessing to you. Now, if you have your Bible today, I want you to turn to two places in your Bible. I want you to turn to Psalms chapter 11 and the little book of Jude. The little book of Jude is the next to last book in the Bible. And Psalms 11 is found on page 604. I want you to turn there. Now, today is Father's Day. And the message will be on cassette tape. I'm going to speak on the faith of our fathers. And the singing and music as well will be on cassette tape. We send them out for a gift of $3 each, and the gift is used to help defray the radio expense. I'll be glad to send you a list of our cassette tape if you write in and request it. Now, if you had the list, you could choose the ones you desire and write in and get them. If you're not getting our daily broadcast, tune into the station at 12 o'clock noon, Monday through Saturday, and get the daily broadcast. we we'll try to be a blessing to you uh, throughout the week. I visited a lady in the hospital just this past week. She'd been listening to the broadcast regularly for a long time. And it thrilled her so very much just for me to come in and shake her hand and have a word of prayer with her. I believe it did her more good than all the medicine she's taken because she listened to us on the broadcast. It'd been such a blessing to us. And then to meet us and to shake her hand and admit so much to her. We thank God for the open door, the ministry of the radio that God's given us yet north side to help get the gospel out in the highways, byways, hedges, prisons, and whatnot. Now, today is Father's Day. The other day I was reading about uh, the father was wanting to call his son in and talk to him about the facts of life. His boy was about 15 years old, and his dad kept putting it off. And so I just got to talk to my boy about the facts of life. He's now 15 years old. So he called him in one day, and he said, Son, Daddy wants to talk with you about the facts of life. The boy said, that's fine, Daddy. He said, what would you like to know? Now, in Psalms chapter 11, I begin reading with verse 1. In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul? Flee as a bird to your mounting. Follow the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may privately shoot at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed... What can the righteous do? Now, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? I want you to keep that in mind. That's a great question. That's why they had the great battle out in the Southern Baptist Convention. They had those liberals that's trying to destroy the foundation of the faith of the saints. They had the conservatives trying to fight for it. That's why they had that big row and fuss and quarrel and fight out there in Texas this past week over that very thing. Now, of course, there's many, many, many liberals still in the convention. They were in there when they went out there. They're in there now. And many of them being supported financially by the conservatives, by the money that's placed in the corporate program of the Southern Baptist Convention. Every time a Christian that drops a dime or a piece of money or tithe or offering in the collection plate in and the Southern Baptist Convention Church, and they have the corporate program, that church member is guilty of help supporting the enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. They're helping to support liberals, and modernists, and infidels that's in the seminaries and high places in the convention. That's what the fight's all about. Reason enough for me to be an independent Baptist preacher, the pastor of an independent Baptist church, have been since 1948 and will be as long as I live. Now, if the foundations be destroyed, then what can the righteous do? If you don't have a foundation, well, you can't stand. Now, turn to the book of Jude, and let's begin reading with verse 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father, 
and preserved in Jesus Christ and call. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I once gave, gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should be earnestly, that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now he's talking there about, of course, the crowd that we have to fight today known as the liberals, the modernists and infidels and the false prophets and teachers. Now he said we must contend for the faith once delivered uh, to the saints. Now God expects us to do that as ministers, as deacons, as teachers, and as church members. Now let's see what our forefathers stood for in days gone by. Now we're living in some fearful days of apostasy. And of course we need men with faith like our forefathers. Thank God for all great men that have great faith that believe this book to be the infallible word of God. Fathers in their homes ought to take the stand for the Bible and believe this book and warn their children about the enemy trying to attack and destroy the faith once delivered to the saints. Now we need to realize that the devil is working now as never before to destroy, to tear down and direct the faith of God's people and he's working uh, feverishly because he knows his time is short. Now let's find out first of all what our fathers believed about the Bible. We've had some great men that's gone on before us. Fathers, grandfathers, great grandfathers and men of old that's stood for this book and some have died for this book. And they would not compromise, laid down their lives for the word of God that we might have this privilege today. Our fathers believe first of all that the Bible is a divine revelation of God unto men. It's a final authority for faith, doctrine and practice. When you get away from this book you have nothing in the world to stand on. That's why you must contend for this book. Our forefathers believed in it. When they picked up the Bible, they said that's the Word of God. That's God's book. Many years ago when someone went into a doctor's office to get glasses, they would say, I can't see how to read my Bible. Today it's different. They go in and get glasses and say, I can't see how to read my newspaper. Now, beloved, that's the difference. Our forefathers and mothers, they put the Bible out there as the number one book to read. And they read their Bible. They believed in that book. It's precious. And so our fathers believe the Bible is divine revelation of God unto man. That's it. No doubt about it. They believed also that it is inspired, inerrant, and infallible word of God. When you run into somebody that says this book is full of contradictions and errors, then that man is an enemy of God, enemy of the Bible. That's what the liberals teach and practice. They don't believe that this is the infallible, inspired, inerrant Word of God. That's what the battle is about out in Texas last week among the Southern Baptists. About 45% of them don't believe the Bible is the inerrant, inspired, infallible Word of God. The other 55 that voted for the president to maintain his position, they do believe that the Bible is the inerrant, inspired Word of God. They believe that. The only thing that bothers me is why they continue to support the others that don't believe it through the corporate program. I can't understand that. One man read back, an outstanding preacher, pastor of the largest Baptist church in Texas, Dr. Chris Vaughan, and said, if you don't believe the Bible to be the word of God, get out of the ministry. This thought came to me, why does he give about a million dollars a year to the liberals, the corporate program, to help tear down the word of God? We need to not be a hypocrite about the matter. We must stand. If we're going to stand, let's stand. And uh, if we're going to support those rascals, then uh, of course, why fight them like that? And then not support them, and then of course, you won't have the blood on your hands. Now, third, that they believed it was written in old time by men of God as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And Second Peter chapter one and verse twenty-one, Simon Peter plainly said, he said the word of God came through holy men of God as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. When men wrote the Bible, sometimes they wrote things they didn't fully understand, but they wrote them because God said write them. And it was the Word of God. God was pinning the Scriptures. God was giving us 
the canon of the Word of God. God was giving us the 66 books as He moved upon those men to write it. Not only that, they believe that the Word of God is ever settled in heaven. In Psalm 119 and verse 89, it says there that the Word of God is forever settled in heaven. If the Word of God is forever settled in heaven, then why does men try to change it down here? They're wrong in doing so. Now you know as well as I, these cults today are trying to change the Bible to fit their belief. And what they teach and preach and believe doesn't fit in the Bible, so they said we can change the Bible. We'll not try to change our people, we just change the Bible. And so they have these new translations. They have the Book of Mormons and they have the Apocrypha and other things that they use uh, many times instead of the Bible along with the Bible and to deceive people. This is the only thing we have. This is the book of God. 66 books. God gave the 66 books. No more and no less. And that's what we have. And our forefathers have stood for it, died for it, suffered for it. And we need to take the same stand. They believed in living and abiding forever. That is, that the word of God would live and abide forever. Now, Jesus said, heaven and earth may pass away, my word will never pass away. They believe it's the greatest book ever written and will never be equal by any other book. Our forefathers believe that. They say the Bible is the greatest book ever written and will never be equal by any other book. Not even the Book of Mormons. Now, beloved, you need to realize that. They believe it is a book to live by and a book to die by. In your dying hour, if you wanted a book to die by, what would you like to have? I'd like to have the Word of God. There's no greater. No greater book to die by than this book. And I thank God for it. And so we need to realize that. Secondly, let's notice what our fathers believed about God. Our fathers believed in a personal God. They believed that. They believed He was, they believed he was the Holy Ghost, omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. They believed in God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They believed that. And they believed in this personal God. Not three gods, one God subsisting in three distinct personalities. They believed in the Trinity. You have a movement today that denied the Trinity. To deny the Trinity is to deny one of the major doctrines in the Bible and it's a very serious matter. It's a dangerous thing to deny the Trinity because the Bible is clear on the teaching of the Trinity. They believe in the work of the Father, the work of the Son, and the work of the Holy Spirit. And so you believe in the Trinity. I believe in the Trinity because the Bible teaches a Trinity. Number three, let's notice what our fathers believed about Satan. Now, if you don't believe there's a devil, I made this statement, I believe, last Sunday. If you don't believe there's a devil, you start looking around at the religions in the world today. Why did those fanatics hijack that plane? And why are we having the trouble now trying to get our men off of that plane? Religion is the cause of that. Those men have been taught if they die for their religion fighting for their country, that they'll go to heaven and be up there with a great reward and die as a martyr. That's why they said they wanted to die. They believe in dying, fighting America, or fighting any other movement in the world other than their own religious movement, that they'll get a great reward when they get to heaven. That's religion for you. They're fanatical religious people. And what a surprise they'll have when they die and open their eyes in hell. Every one of them is going to hell because they don't believe in Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. And no man can to the Father except by me. So all those Muslims will fall off into hell when they die. And what a surprise they'll have when they open the eyes in hell, thinking they're going to heaven and receive a great reward. Our fathers believe in a personal devil. They believe he's the God of this age. They believe he's limited and destined to the lake of fire. They believe that the Bible tells us that. In the future, the devil will go to the lake of fire. They believe he's against everything God is for and against the people of God. Our fathers believe that. They believe the devil is against everything God is for and against the people of God. The devil is against you. He's your enemy. They believe he's behind all the evil in the world today. And that is true. Our forefathers believe that. And we should believe that. Number four... Our fathers, let's find out what our fathers believed about man. They had conviction about man. They believed that man is a trinity. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23, the Bible plainly said you have a body, a soul, and a spirit. 
You here in the auditorium, you're looking at me today, you can only see my body. But I'm a trinity, I have a soul and spirit you can't see. So man's a trinity. They believe that man is born in sin. The Bible tells you in Psalms chapter 51 and verse 5 that man is born in sin. He comes here a sinner. He's conceived in sin. He's born in sin. They believe that. They believe that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Therefore, they believe that everybody must be redeemed if they go to heaven ere they reach the age of accountability. That is when they're old enough or intelligent enough to know right from wrong. They have to get saved if they go to heaven. Our fathers believe that about man. Let's notice number five, what our fathers believed about sin. They believe that sin is wrong and sin means to miss the mark. See, we have to hit the mark which is right. If we miss that mark which is right, then that's sin, missing the mark. They believe that sin wrecks. It wrecks homes. It wrecks uh, uh, villages. It wrecks governments. Sin is a wrecker. They believe that sin mars. There's people, they carry terrible scars in their bodies, in their homes, in the community because of sin. It mars and it scars. They believe that the wages of sin is death because the Bible plainly tells us the wages of sin is death. They believe that the blood was the only remedy for sin. The Bible says in John chapter 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins... He is faithful, he's just forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Simon Peter said, we're redeemed with the precious blood of the Lamb. Our fathers believe that. The modernists, the liberals today do not believe in the blood atonement. They have taken the blood out of the hymnals. And in the new translations of their Bibles, they leave out uh, uh, verses pertaining to the blood and so forth. They don't believe that. They call that a slaughterhouse religion. But we believe in it. God believes in it and has put in the Bible and we must believe it. Number six, let's see what our fathers believed about salvation. Our fathers had great conviction about salvation, what it is and what it means. They believed it was man's deepest need. There's no need for any man on the earth today any greater than the need for salvation. That's number one. The Bible says, Seek ye the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things be added unto you. Number one is your need for salvation. They believed it was of the Lord. Salvation is entirely of the Lord. The Bible says in Jonah chapter 2 and verse 9, He remembered salvation is of the Lord, and God delivered him from the fish's belly. We know that salvation is of the Lord in its origination. It's of God in its uh, application, and in its effectuation, and in its consummation. Salvation is all of the Lord. Our fathers believed that. We couldn't save ourselves. God had to save us. They believed that. They believed it was planned before the foundation of the world. Salvation is not an afterthought with God. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God didn't uh, panic and say, no, wait a minute, they got to run and plan out a way whereby I can uh, redeem that man. No, sir. Salvation was planned out before God ever placed Adam in the garden. It was all fixed up between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, exactly what had to be done. They believe was offered to man through the gospel. When you hear the gospel, then you have salvation offered to you. They believe that others must be told about it through God's people. Angels are not coming down here and tell people about salvation. Seraphims and cherubims are not coming to this earth and tell people about salvation. If people hear about salvation, we'll have to let them know about it. And God expects us to let them know about it. Our fathers believe that. That's why they witness for God. Number seven, let's see what our fathers believed about hell. They believe that hell is literal. There is a literal burning hell. They believe that all sinners will go there. They believe that hell is a place of fire. That is burning, tormenting fire. I was greatly shocked some time ago when I turned on TV when Billy Graham was on with his program and I'd heard he'd put the fire in hell as far as he is concerned. Then I heard it with my own mouth. Billy Graham said he believed that hell would just be in a way from God, abandoned from God. He believed that was hell. Well, I don't believe a word of that. I believe there's fire in hell like the Bible tells us. See, when you start running with the liberals and infidels and modernists and lie down with the dogs, you're going to get up with fleas on you. And that's why he believes that. Beloved, when you begin to put the fire in hell, 
then you're doing terrible damage to the cause of God in the Bible. There's a literal burning fire in hell. Just like God said, you better believe this book. They believe that hell is a place of torment. The rich man said, I'm tormented in these flames. I'm tormented in these flames, talking about fire. Now they believe that hell is a place of no escape. I, our forefathers believe that hell is a place of no escape. You can't get out of there. Nobody will get out of hell until the judgment and God will let them out for judgment and then they'll go to the lake of fire. You can't get out of hell. They believe that sinners should be warned about hell. We ought to warn people about hell. We got loved ones going to hell. I have loved ones going to hell, on the road to hell if they're not stopped and not turned back. If you don't get right with God, they're just as certain to burn and a torment in hell as you're listening to me today. Lost without God and they have no promise of tomorrow. Our fathers believed in a burning hell. Number eight, let's notice what our fathers believed about heaven. I like that. Our fathers believe that heaven is real. I believe that, don't you? Heaven is a real place where people go beyond this life. They believe that heaven is a place where God's children will go when they depart this life. They'll go right into the paradise of God, a place called heaven. They believe that heaven is a place of peace and rest and satisfaction. All of our loved ones that suffer in body down here, that's gone on to paradise, they're resting, they're at peace. They're in the paradise of God. The picture of a baby in a mother's arms is a picture of our people in the paradise of God. They are there, resting, waiting, there until God is finished with his program upon the earth. They believe that heaven is where God is. God is there in heaven, in person. They believe that heaven is a place where angels are. A lot of people, they don't believe in angels. All through this Bible, you read about angels. I believe in angels. The Bible said there's multitudes and multitudes of angels in heaven. I believe that. When you get to heaven, you're going to see multitudes of heavenly hosts, angels, plus the redeemed human beings. They believe that heaven is a place of reunion. That is, when we go to heaven, we'll be reunited with our loved ones. That word reunion means reunited with our loved ones on the other side. We'll join up with them, be there with them, reunite with them forever. And then they believe that heaven is our eternal home. One of these days we go into that eternal home. When we get to that eternal home, then we're going to be so happy and so thrilled about it. We'll never want to leave it and we'll never have to leave it. You know, Paul was caught up into the third heaven and he heard words unspeakable, not lawful for him to give out upon the earth. And he couldn't hardly wait to get back to paradise. God didn't tell us a whole lot about heaven because he wants us to be satisfied down here till time come to go. And if we knew more about heaven, we'd be wanting to die and be praying to die. And God knew that. And so he didn't tell us too much about it. There's a man one time. He was kind of sick. Then, had a lot of hard luck. And he was vulnerable to all kind of attacks of the devil. And he couldn't quite cope with the situation. And he sent for a friend to come over and talk with him and, and see if he could help him. His friend went over and he said, you know, I, 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 I love God. I just can't understand these things. I wonder if God loves me. And. The man said, listen, he said, I have a little girl at my home, said she can't talk, but she's sweet. And said, when I go in, said, I, um, I take her in my lap and she laughs and I play with her and I tell her I love her. And it just thrills her little heart. And I tell her how precious she is and how wonderful she is. Said, uh, I just, so I wouldn't take a million dollars for her, but said she can't tell me she loves me and that she doesn't read it love me in that sense because she doesn't know that much about love and but said uh, I tell her I love her and she means so much to me and he said now listen man it's not how much you love God you need to realize just how much God loves you and said like I love my little daughter is the way God loves us our little love toward God doesn't amount to too much it's his love toward us that really counts in that day and now in that hour and I'm so glad that it does. Let me give you this little uh, uh, example here of a father's example. And I want you to listen to it very closely. Their little eyes up on you. They're watching night and day. Their little ears that listen to every word you say. Their little hands all eager. Do the things you do. And a little boy who is dreaming of the day he'll be like you. You're the little fellow's idol. You're the wisest of the wise. In his little mind about you, 
no suspicion ever rise. He believes in you devoutly, holds all that you say and do. He will say and do in your way when he's grown up just like you. There's a wide-eyed little fella who believes you're always right and his ears are always open as he watches day and night. You're setting an example every day and all you do for the little boy is waiting to grow up to be just like you. That's how little children feel toward their dads. Many years ago, Dr. Bob Jones Sr. told the story, very touching. He was going quite often in meetings, and when he'd come back home, little Bob Jones Jr., just a little boy at that time, would run and meet him and kiss him, and then uh, he would uh, kiss his daddy before he went to bed every night, hug his neck and kiss him, and then he'd go get in his little crib. And one, one day when Dr. Bob came in, and, and Mrs. Jones said, uh, Bob said, Junior has been awful mean today. They'd been very mean and very unruly. And Dr. Bob had kind of touched his heart. So that night he thought he uh, knew a way to punish him maybe that would uh, help him to do better. And when little Bob Jr. came to put his arms around daddy's neck to kiss him, his dad refused to kiss him and refused to uh, let, let him kiss him. And a little fella turned, walked away and went to his little crib and with his little head bowed and went in there and got in the crib and went to sleep. Dr. Bob got to thinking about that and he got up and slipped the door late on that night. The moon was shining through the window right on the little fellow there. And he'd cried himself to sleep. And there he was snubbing in his sleep. And what he was crying for is because daddy wouldn't kiss him and wouldn't let him kiss daddy because he had been mean. Dr. Bob said that broke my heart. That I had to punish him like that. And said I stood there and watched the moonbeams coming down upon my little boy. While those tears had run down his cheeks and while he was still snubbing although he was asleep. He said, my heart hurt, and I was hurt far worse than my little boy was hurt because of that thing. I hate to do it, but I had to do it. It hurt me deeply. And when parents that love their children try to correct them, sometimes it hurts the parents as much even more than it does the children. But they know they got to do it. They know they must do it. And they know if they don't do it, they'll be held responsible, and God will hold them responsible. And just like it hurt Dr. Bob, the way he had to correct that boy, the way he had to punish him, it hurts, it hurts us to do our children have to correct them. And it hurts God when God has to chase his own children. It touches the heart of God. And we need to realize that God loves us. Regardless of how much you love him, he loves you if you're his child. And God's doing the best for you that you'll let him do. And God wants to bless you. And God wants to be real to you. And God loves you every step of the way, every day and every night. And you need to realize that. And as a father, you have a great and grave responsibility. Many of the dads led his family to hell. There may be some listening to radio listeners right now. And you haven't carried your children to church. You're living like the devil, drinking your liquor, beer and wine. And, and living a terrible, rough life. And your children are following your footsteps. And you may lead your own flesh and blood into the flames of hell. And that will be awful if you do so. You better wake up before it's too late. Let's stand to our feet. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, we come with thanksgiving, with praise, with adoration. Our Father, we thank thee for all of our precious fathers today that really sacrificed and stood for the gospel and the word of God. We thank you for those that love you, that's trying their best to bring their children to church and have their home the right kind it should be. We pray for our fathers today. Thank you for every one of them. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, while Debbie plays the stanza, so if there's anybody in this building that needs to be saved, or come forward for rededication, or you need uh, to join the church, or if you need to come, I want you to obey the Spirit of God and just come forward while she plays. Would you do it? Why wait just a moment?